one sip of water. All right, well, let's start by praying. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and we pray for your blessing on this class and on the whole service that you would be glorified and that all of your saints here would be edified by all the truth of yours that we look into. And we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're at, uh, well, it's chapter 6, or is it chapter, well, it's week 6. Yeah, it is chapter 6. There's one more chapter after this week, and that's on the church. But this is the biggest chapter, the longest chapter. It's 40 pages total uh, on salvation, and I'm calling it because I don't know how else to hear the liberal, not just in that day, but the progressive Christian in our day. And that's the title, Save Yourselves Together in Jesus' Name. That's the gospel to them. They may not want to admit that that's what they're saying, but that is what they're saying. So liberalism, as Machen says, quote, presents an entirely different account of the way of salvation. Liberalism finds salvation, so far as it's willing to speak at all of salvation, in man. Christianity finds it in an act of God. How is this the case? Well, to repeat the real cardinal difference as something that Machen's already said, but now we're just going to see it slightly different words. He says, according to Christian belief, Jesus is our Savior, not by virtue of what he said, not even by virtue of what he was, but by what he did. Now, stop right there. Majin's not denying that there's an intimate connection between who he is and what he did, as if who he is is irrelevant to that question or is not foundational to that question. He's making a specific point about what is front and center in the gospel, okay? So, by what he did. He is our Savior not because he inspired us to live the same kind of life that he lived, but because he took upon himself the dreadful guilt of our sins and bore it instead of us on the cross. So here's the outline. It's a little in order in terms of the chapter, but it's such a big chapter that how do you even put it in order? Um, there's, a, there's a massive amount of space taken on the idea of the atonement, and so that's going to be the, maj- the biggest section of ours. But surrounding that... We're just going to tackle this. By the way, I, I mentioned this in passing, uh, I don't know, two times ago, this thing I came up with a couple years ago, the, the five points of modernism, and, I, and it mirrors the five points of Calvinism. That's the whole point. It makes it memorable. And as I'm looking back at my original notes, I realize, oh, there it is. I found it in there. It's in this chapter. So we'll get to see that. But there I'm just going to make a broader point. And then we'll look at that big section on the atonement, And then finally, we'll look at two more challenges that Machen puts back to the liberal in terms of God and man. So actually, let's uh, hold there for a second. But just notice at this point that the liberal has taught all of his children in the new liberalism to marginalize the biblical gospel as a subtle theory of the atonement or some other way of escape from our world of injustice. Oftentimes, this will come in the form of not people saying, not criticizing the old view of the atonement usually does go together, but usually if they're not brave enough to do that, they'll at least start to say that, well, your emphasis is escapism. It's individualistic salvation. That's kind of the way N.T. Wright did it in a lot of his books in the new perspective on Paul. There was always this, oh, no, I'm not denying justification by faith alone. No, I'm not denying the imputed righteousness of Christ. But that wasn't Paul's point. And the gospel and justification is not this story of how we escape from hell and go to heaven, this sort of escapism from this world. So so it's it's a very subtle way of not, not denying the old doctrine, but sort of discoloring it or making you have a distaste for it, maybe is the way to say it, a way of escape from our world of injustice. Or, or you just dismiss the orthodox doctrine as hard or elitist or divisive. And by contrast, how simple and 
practical and unifying the way of modernism is. So that, that trick is going to stay with us as we look at the, at the gospel or at salvation. So let's get to this, what I mean by the five points of modernism. I'll, I'll draw out the points in a second, but let's just look at a simple chart first. Here you have, quote-unquote, the old gospel of Western Christendom, its way of escape, the individual escaping this world to God, as opposed to what we really have, in the, and a lot of times this would take the form of, this is Greek Gnostic escapism from the body. That would be the, the criticism of people like Wright and others. Whereas in the Jewish mindset, you really have this communal emphasis. But what, what they couple with that, maybe not in the same place, but you start to get it in the rest of their writing, is that this collective emphasis is already assuming that the problem's out there. And if the problem's out there, well, then the solution has to be out there. We've got to fix that. We, together, have to fix things out there. So the most famous element of liberal Christianity is the so-called social gospel. And so when we say that liberalism finds some kind of salvation in man, we it comes to mean collective man. Liberalism has a lot of trouble dealing with the individual man as an individual man. And why is this? It's because in the modern worldview, what naturalism, or you can call it materialism, what that does to the soul is it reduces it to this material mass inside this larger material reality because that's really all we have to do business with. And that, by the way, that's more loving and down-to-earth and all that stuff anyway. But it reduces this soul to something, even modern psychology does this. It talks about psychology, of course the word, you know, suke, that means the soul. But what does it do with it? It, it reduces the soul into something that's not a soul anymore. It's a material mass, it's this stimuli mechanism at best. It's certainly not a moral actor in the universe. And it's certainly not a soul that will never die. And so that's what modernism does to the individual soul to begin with. And what this implies is that both the problem for man and the solution for man is going to be wholly constructed of a collective and material solution. So whether you like it or not, and the church and its elite um, power structures in the last 20 years has tried to cover this up, but thinkers in the church knew this 20, 30 years ago and back, that where you see materialism and naturalism, there you see collectivism. And where you see collectivism, there you see materialism and naturalism. One leads to the other. They're inseparable. If you reduce human beings and history and all these different things to material mass, well, then you're going to get mass solutions. And that's where the individual is lost. So it begins to view man as a cog in something like a larger machine. Man is part of the material mass. His basic needs are material. The basic solution is going to be to fix the present material conditions outside of him. Now, that's not new. We saw that in the 19th century. Feuerbach, a book called The Essence of Christianity, he's the guy that came up with the saying, you are what you eat. But he didn't mean what your mom meant. He meant you literally are material stuff. And he reduced all of Christianity to that. And he does it before Darwin comes along and gives it a biological scheme. But this is going to require something more than just a descriptive narrative. In other words, the liberal is not just saying that everything is getting better. He has to say to people in the church, because the majority of people in the West are still kind of in the church. The majority of people are still not atheists. So they have to have a message. They have to package this for the church. It's not inevitable progress yet without your help. In a sense, the only thing that's missing is you. It's an appeal to the masses that history is going to get better if we all do our part. So it becomes a totalizing program. So anyway, all that to say, here's my little, here's my little thing that I developed. And this is the 2016 version. I'll, I'll show you this in a second, the 2022 version, a couple, a couple changes I've noticed. But this you can go all the way back to the 19th century. What's the problem? Historical depravity. The problem is the past, everything in the past, everything outside of us. But if that's true, what follows? Well, then those things have to be deconstructed. All of those things have to be deconstructed. The family, they won't start with that. That's not a very wholesome thing to say. And so when Marx and Engels wanted to include that at first, they were advised not to. They did after. They started with things like law 
and morality and religion. Religion's the opiate to the masses, but all of it is really the opiate to the masses. They call this the false consciousness. All the things that God created at the beginning and said is good, these guys came around and said, that's bad. Those things are invented by a power class to keep the weak and the downtrodden downtrodden, to give them a story, to pat them on the head and say, they're there, you just accept your place in God's providence and so forth. So all of those things that Christians would have called the, the orders of creation or these social spheres or institutions, Marx came along and said, those things are actually this false consciousness. Those institutions were constructed in order to abuse people. And so those have to be deconstructed. So it's an unconditional deconstruction because nothing is left unturned. Well, then what is that? How, how do we make things right? So that's environmental atonement. Now, these two, I want to, as things have gone on and the veil has come off, especially in the last 10 years, you see that what's really mostly wrong in the environment outside of us is group-oriented, group grievances and so forth. So it's an ethnic atonement. Now, there's actually no atonement. There's no forgiveness. You can't make it better. That's another story, another class for another day. But how does that come to us, this solution? Well, new institutions. So that grace has to come to us, sorry, institutional grace. Now, that's kind of taken on a more specific flavor as well in the last two years. Because who can be in charge of those institutions and what are they and what's the basis of that? Again, it's those grievances. And some people have more grievances than others. So if you're, if you're, just a, if you're a woman... That's one point. You're downtrodden. But if you're a right-handed Anglo-Saxon heterosexual woman, well, then you only have that one point. But, um, but, if you, but if you have additional grievances, if you're a part of other classes, then this is called intersectionality. Okay. What does this have to do with the gospel? Nothing. It's a false gospel, but that is what they are putting forward as the gospel, and it's actually an anti-gospel. And it's always come to this. The perseverance of the state. And that was Hegel, that dialectic I showed you last time, that development in history. Where's this going? Well, the state is God's march through history. Now, by God, he doesn't mean the God that stands over all, that never changes at all. This God actually changes with history, and we arrive at this place. And that is what is being said in the church. You say, no, that's not what's being said in the church. I mean, the stuff about Jesus, meek, and mild, and all that stuff, I, I know that. That's what they were saying. That's what they were selling. But they're doing it in language, and they've been doing it for 100 years or more, but they're doing it in language where you don't see it, where you don't peel back the veil, where you don't go up the stairs and you see, where's this water coming from anyway? And that's where it's coming from. And so I call it the five points of modernism. Now, another objection exists uh, for the liberal against the supernatural outlook, and Machen recognizes this. And one of the things you, you could say is that Christians could... Um, answer the call and be moral in society and have a Christian view of all these other things in addition to the gospel, and, and we should. The gospel should change things. Now, those changing of things is not the gospel, but the gospel should have effects. And one of the most immediate effects that I think all Christians can agree on is that we're changed. But the unbeliever looks at us, and I think we can look at ourselves sometimes and say, it doesn't look like we are changing much. Um, are Christians really new creatures? So Machen deals with this for a couple of pages, too. Uh, Christians look sometimes like they sin worse than their non-Christian neighbors. The first answer he gives might not satisfy the skeptic, but it is the immediate answer that the New Testament gives. He says, quote, The change has not come to full fruition. Sin has not yet been fully conquered. The beginning of the Christian life is a new birth, not an immediate creation of a full-grown man. That's an important point for Christian witness. Uh, when we argue for faithfulness to the biblical gospel, against the demands of the culture, against the things that the culture is saying, well, if, if your gospel is true, it should be able to do this and this and that. Um, when we resist that and stay faithful to the biblical gospel, we're not arguing that there's no superior moral life, that the gospel does and ought to create uh, a superior moral life, but the order is going to matter. God making us right in Christ precedes God making us good by the Spirit in us. So your understanding... I would say that your understanding of the order of salvation is actually going to um, be important for understanding how to stay faithful to the gospel in the face of false gospels in the culture. So that's just an introductory, that first section, 
big picture, what's this war really about? And eventually what you come to see at the end of it, after about 100 years of it, is, okay, everything I see out there on the news every day, modern ideology as a whole, this is their gospel. And, and this, it's not something you can keep out of the church and say, well, as long as that stuff never gets into the church. No, it's, Satan's immediately going to try to bring it into the church uh, through deceptive means. Well, that brings us to our biggest section. And that's the liberal attack on the atonement. Right at the heart of the gospel, they have to do something with the cross. They can't just show up on day one and give you that chart like I just did. They have to sound like they accept this Jesus and this cross and and in these gospels. So the change has to happen gradually. So how could the liberal cross be brought brought into relation to, to the depravity of the outside world in the past? The liberal worldview, that I, the modern worldview that I just showed you, how could they give you a different cross? Well, Machen replies that, quote, the essence of it is that the death of Christ has an effect not upon God, but only upon man. And that translates the cross into a convenient symbol for all self-sacrifice. If you ever do study a class on the cross or the atonement and and you see different atonement theories in church history, one of the things you want to pay attention to is is to ask yourself the question, how do all these rival atonement theories, what do they have to do with modern liberalism? Is there a way in which if I buy into that view of the atonement that I'm actually completely changing the gospel into some kind of a social work? In other words, is this view of the atonement, does it fit perfectly with that, that other, the other parts of their worldview? So, um, on the other hand, Machen says, perhaps the death of Christ shows how much God hates sin. So he's talking about the liberal, the liberal still sounding faithful to it, so long as it is a sin that we commit against each other. So modern liberalism can embrace uh, all sorts of... These are, and these are, by the way, I wrote on the bottom, the other atonement theories that have been popular throughout church history. There's the ransom to Satan theory. Now, we would say, ransom to Satan? The only thing that God owes Satan is a, is a beating. And, and by the way, that did happen by the cross, but man, that can't be accurate. Governmental theory of the atonement, I'm not going to go into all of these, but um, moral influence, that the cross influences us with God's love. We see that. It affects us. It's an example. And then uh, more recently, in the 20th century, the Christus Victor view that it achieved a victory over the devil. If you look at all those, <clears throat> so long as you get rid of the, the false view in it, one of the things that you notice is that the cross actually does affect all those things. There's verses that you can look at where the cross has those effects, but is that the heart of it? Is that the core of it? And no, the core of it is, is substitutionary punishment. It used to be called the penal substitutionary view of the atonement or the vicarious atonement view. And, and, and sometimes you'll hear that called, and watch this in a book, you'll know you're, you're dealing with a liberal or at least somebody's trying to impress the wrong people. They'll use the, oh, the Anselmian, that's Anselm's theory of the atonement, uh, or even calling it a theory. If you call it a theory at all, I know right away that you're still, you're at least trying to impress the wrong people. I mean, this is the heart of the gospel. It's not really up for debate as far as what the core uh, accomplishment was here. But anyway, the manward effects of the cross are the things to be retained in liberalism. If the cross is God's love toward us, it's difficult to see what grace we receive by it other than the, the oft-repeated peace on earth, goodwill to men. I imagine there was probably a liberal that first worked for Hallmark and created all those Christmas cards that say goodwill, uh, peace to, or sorry, peace on earth, goodwill to men. Um, it might surprise you that's not what Luke's gospel says in Luke 2.14. He says, on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. So it was a particular goodwill toward man that he was bringing. Now, anyone who's taken a good course in the doctrine of the atonement will know that those are all, those all alter- alternative theories are all twisted truths. They're, they're taking part of it and they pluck it from its context. And Machen answers those theories from which the liberal atonement borrows, by saying this. He says, They do indeed all contain an element of truth. 
It is true that the death of Christ is an example of self-sacrifice, which may inspire self-sacrifice in others. It is true that the death of Christ shows how much God hates sin. It is true that the death of Christ displays the love of God. All of the truths are found plainly in the New Testament. But they are swallowed up in a far greater truth, that Christ died instead of us to present us faultless before the throne of God. Without that central truth, all the rest is devoid of real meaning. An example of self-sacrifice is useless to those who are under both the guilt and thraldom of sin. The knowledge of God's hatred of sin can in itself bring only despair. An exhibition of the love of God is a mere display unless there were some underlying reason for the sacrifice. Right? If I say, um, I'll solve your problem, I'll die for you. How's that solve my problem? Well, it might in a moment, if what I'm doing is stepping in front of a bullet, but again, just for a moment, it doesn't solve the biggest problem. So the early liberal preacher mocked not only the intellectual rigor of the traditional word of the cross, it also mocked its alleged barbarism. The blood of the cross, the appeasement of a bloodthirsty deity, these were all the marks of primitive religion. That, again, is liberal religion talking. These are now judged unworthy of the religion of our enlightened age. And so consequently, liberalism set to work on a non-violent atonement. In the newer progressivism, one of the earliest theological moves in about between the years 2000 and 2005 was the um, now sometimes called the divine child abuse ob objection. Uh, Steve Chalk in the UK would make this objection, and they, they sought to replace it with a non-violent atonement. Um, some of the analogies that they use, somebody, Brian McLaren, for example, in the Emergent Church, he used the analogy of the, the old view is like a drunken husband who would come home and instead of kicking the wife and kid, would, would kick the dog or something like that. And I'm like, really? That is your view? Of the, but that was. That was their view. And so a nonviolent atonement. Again, not new. Anselm dealt with that objection in his book on the atonement. But that's what you get with liberalism. Another criticism of the historic cross was its historicity. Why? Because supernature cannot act in history. And so nothing in history could possibly make an eternal difference. However, there is something very essential about the eternal working of the cross in history. And so Machen said, A gospel independent of history is a contradiction in terms. The Christian gospel means not a presentation of what has always been true, in other words, in nature and history, but a report of something new, something that imparts a totally different aspect to the situation of mankind. The situation of mankind was desperate because of sin, but God has changed the situation by the atoning death of Christ. Next, the liberal will turn his guns on the terrible news of the old cross, that it is very narrow. It's an exclusive cross. It saves only some and not all. So, of course, one of the things you're going to see a lot is a lot of the things you see in liberalism you already saw in Arminianism. And, in fact, in many aspects of Arminianism led to certain aspects of liberalism. But here it's the exclusivity. If he saves some, then he ought to be able to save all, able to. You see they're already kind of changing the subject in a way. And not only that he ought to be able, but that God, if he's love, would surely want to. This is the exclusivist dimension of the Christian message, and it was resented from the very beginning. It was resented by the Romans. Pagan religious uh, landscape was characterized by syncretism. It's live and let live stance toward the local cults. And so in Roman religion, you could worship whatever local deity you wanted. As long as when Caesar's armies came to town... The, the Pax Romana was, was upheld. You bowed to Caesar. You said, Kaiser, Kurios, Caesar is Lord. Christians wouldn't do that. Christians would say that only Christ is Lord. And so the, the Christian movement got itself in trouble at the heart of the gospel, the exclusivist dimension. That's, that's political rebellion. The gospel, the heart of the gospel, the cross, the exclusive, that this, is, this makes a new human race, out of the old human race, that there's a radical division here, that this is our ultimate allegiance, all of that uh, stands against any 
political form or any social form that demands ultimate allegiance. So again, you, you can't separate your gospel from your, your larger worldview. And so the modern liberal stands with the ancient pagan. The liberal stands ready to persevere. If you're ever wondering, here's another reason. It's not just the materialism and the problems out there. The other reason that the liberal must stand with the statist is because the liberal and the statist, just like the ancient Roman, believed that we were all one. And Christianity does not. So you, you can't separate that part from the gospel. The liberal stands ready to persecute the church for its being a public nuisance. Um, as things continue to develop over the next couple of years, just watch this, I guarantee you. I'll, I'll, this is not a hard prediction, it's just the way it always is. What you're going to see is that people that have the most liberal theology are the people that are going to turn on you and turn you over to the authorities. There's, there's no mystery as to why that is. They have a shared worldview with them. They believe it's all one and that you are an enemy of the people for believing in this kind of a gospel. No, I just believe in the gospel, not all that political stuff. You, you don't have that choice. It's a political crime in this world. When a liberal sees the cross, he stands condemned for the same reason as the pagan. Unlike the pagan, he's had time to think about it, though. The pagan may have invented the cross to kill, but the liberal has to explain it away. In a sense, the liberal has a greater guilt for his aversion to the cross because he's been a child of the church. He's, he's looked at it and assessed it for longer, and in, and in a sense, he has a greater disgust for the cross than the garden variety pagan. So by clearing this ground of bloody, historic, exclusive atonement, the liberal can say that salvation is still through Christ, it's just not through Christ alone. And that's sort of their, their first step. Inclusivism is, is their first step toward universalism. Now, Machen adds to that, but modern liberalism has still more specific objections to the Christian doctrine of the cross. How can one person, it is asked, suffer for the sins of another? The thing we are told is absurd. Guilt, it is said, is personal, which, by the way, they don't believe anymore. So original liberalism at least wanted to start here, but now guilt is collective. But anyway, guilt, we are told, is absurd. Guilt is, uh, sorry, guilt is said is personal. If I allow another man to suffer for my fault, my guilt is not thereby one whit diminished. He says, the real answer to the objection is to be found not in the similarity between the death of Christ and other examples of self-sacrifice, but in the profound difference. It is because men have lost sight of the majesty of Jesus' person. They think of him as a man like themselves. And if he was a man like themselves, his death becomes simply an example of self-sacrifice. Now, it's perfectly true that no mere man can pay the penalty of another man's sin. But it does not follow that Jesus could not do it. For Jesus was no mere man, but the eternal Son of God. So you see, more presuppositions leading to conclusions. Two different staircases, but just one little inference. You start with that assumption in blue, you get that conclusion in red. So you see that just as the liberals' consequent view of a nonviolent atonement follows from their prior view of a non-wrathful deity. If you, if you start with a non-wrathful deity, what kind of atonement must you have? Well, you have to exclude a wrath-bearing substitution. You can't have a violent atonement because you don't have a wrathful deity. Well, in the same way, the liberals' prior view of a merely human Jesus gives you a man who cannot take upon himself the sins of others. You see how Doctrines are connected, and sub-doctrines are connected to other parts of doctrine. If you commit yourself to certain views in one area, well, then another area in orthodoxy won't make sense to you. You'll have to change that, too. It's that ball of yarn, remember? It's all connected. You, you tug at the one part, and it, it yanks the rest out. Finally, the very character of God seems to the liberal to disallow the traditional doctrine. God alienated from man. God unreconciled. Certainly, we might be unreconciled and going on in the wrong direction, but surely God himself is, is bigger than all that. Well, again, Machen replies, The objection depends, of course, upon the liberal view of sin. This business of letting bygones be bygones has a pleasant sound, 
But in reality, it is the most heartless thing in the world. It will not do at all, even in the case of sins committed against our fellow men. In the case of the more serious wrongs, such as wrongs against God, such repayment is, is usually quite impossible. Now, he, he was saying about, he was making an analogy, you know, even in this world, it doesn't really work. But it certainly is not going to work with sins against God. All that the liberal means by this change of mind and heart on the part of the sinner is an internal change. But what about the person that's wronged? What about his honor? What about his glory? It actually makes nothing right and leaves injured the main person wrong. Now, here we're speaking um, analogically. Uh, the liberal, you know, every, I always say this, every lie is a twisted truth. If a liberal says, isn't God bigger than all that? Now, that is a lie he's telling, but it is based on a truth. Of course, we don't mean that God is actually injured in terms of hurt, that we have thwarted his will or anything like that. But we are speaking about a dishonor that his glory has been trampled upon, and therefore his justice has been um, set aside, has been trampled upon, and so forth. It's not actually doing anything to his being, but justice has to be meted out. The greater the character of the person injured in this sense, the greater the injustice of the sin. The greater the honor and the esteem of the injured person to the good of anyone else affected, the more cruel and life-diminishing that sin is to everyone else. I could be tempted to go into that, but we only got about 10 minutes here. But Machen says, all sin at bottom is against God. You can cite Psalm 51, verse 5, to justify that. And what follows in the Christian view is that every other thing that sin is consequently flows from the injury done to God's honor. Everything else that is just like the, you know, the rival theories of the atonement have a truth. There are things that sin does that you're being rescued from that are true. Sin does distort your own soul. Part of redemption is you're being redeemed from that. Sin does destroy things in the world. That's going to be redeemed too. But that's not fundamentally what you're being saved from. You're fundamentally saved from God, from His wrath. And so if you have that in mind, that exactly parallels what the liberal is, is doing wrong over here. So not only then is the, the social gospel a fraud, but the social ills that it aims to alleviate are all caused by the old thing that they are not calling sin. So sin against God and your alienation against God is the reason why you have all the other problems in the world. Again, we can't prove any of these things. It takes separate classes to do that, but that's uh, Machen's burden to show. And that brings us to the last point, um, what I'm going to just call two challenges back to the liberal. And the two challenges can be described in this way, just two questions. Where do you find the goodness of man, and where do you find the love of God? Liberals had a different answer to all these questions we've looked at, the character of God, the nature of Scripture, Christ, the gospel. So just another way to expose some of this, we could ask, where do you find the goodness of man, and where do you find the love of God? What's the liberals trying to find, the liberals saying he, that these are central to the Christian worldview, and part of what Machen wants to show is that that's not even true, the liberals' answer to these things. So what do I have first? Okay, so first I have the Christian picture, and then I'll show you the, the liberal picture. But in the Christian picture, where do we find the love of God? Well, 1 John 4.10 flatly tells you, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation of our sins. So where do we find the love of God? The cross, preeminently. That's where we find the love of God. Where do we find the goodness of man? Only on this side and on that side. If you're looking for the goodness of man, if you try to look in the mirror apart from Christ, you're not going to find it. Just as you won't find the love of God there, same reason you won't find the goodness of man there. So I show you the Christian picture just to set up really uh, the liberal picture. So have that in your mind. Here's how, here's how it looks different. Remember that, that uh, trajectory, the inevitable progress. Notice now that the love of God and the goodness of man are no longer at these points. They're everywhere in between. Except, and those points, they're all myths anyway. Now, liberal's not going to say that at first. As I said, that's a development that happens over time. 
but paradise lost and paradise regained and a supernatural dealing with your eternal problem on the cross, all three of those, as it turns out, if the liberal would just have been honest from the beginning, he's saying that they're myths. So the liberal is following the naturalist in speaking of a man without sin and a God without wrath, all within nature. And so surely if man was born innocent and if evil comes from without, then we ought to be able to find, we're used to making arguments like this as Calvinists, but this is kind of Machen's point here. If that's all true, we ought to be able to find some exceptions to decadent societies. We ought to be able to find some islands, some pockets of resistance, maybe 50%, certainly at least a quarter of the cultures of mankind that have been nothing but good, that, okay, we're all good now, quick, quarantine the island, don't let sin get in. But in fact, we see absolutely nothing of a good nature. Liberal theology urges upon us a God who is necessarily benevolent toward us. This is a God who we can love and worship, but Machen responds in two ways. In the first place, does it work? So there he's attacking the liberal's pragmatism. And in the second place, is it true? Does it work first? Well, it certainly ought to work. How can anyone be unhappy when the ruler of the universe is declared to be the loving father of all men who will never permanently inflict pain upon his children? So stop right there. Do you see what Machen's saying there? If God is all love, smiles, and as C.S. Lewis said one time, we, we're not looking for a father in heaven so much as a grandfather in heaven, a senile old benevolence who will say at the end of the day to everyone that, a, that everyone's had a good time. Well, is everybody having a good time? Is, is that what we see in the world? That's what Machen's saying. How, do you, how does the liberal understand evil? He says, where, where is the sting of remorse if all sin is necessarily, will necessarily be forgiven? Yet men are strangely ungrateful. After the modern preacher has done his part with all diligence, after everything unpleasant has, been carefully, has carefully been eliminated from the conception of God, after his unlimited love has been celebrated with the eloquence that it deserves, the congregation somehow persistently refuses to burst into the old ecstasies of joy. The truth is, the God of modern preaching, though he may perhaps be very good, is rather uninteresting. Nothing is so insipid as indiscriminate good humor. Is that really love that costs so little? If God will necessarily forgive, no matter what we do, why trouble ourselves about Him at all? Such a God may deliver us from the fear of hell, but His heaven, if He has any, is full of sin. By the way, another way to get to that is, is to poke at the, the typical Arminian um, presentation that, that God loves you, or Jesus loves you, or, or God loves you unconditionally. And, uh, and well, if, if, if that's true, if, if I'm hearing that as an unbeliever, I'm like, all right, cool. Bye. I'm going to go back to sinning now. Because according to you, this doesn't make any difference. God just loves us unconditionally and so forth. So that, that's a problem. But remember, there was a second question that Machen asked. Is it even true? The truth is that it is not only human innocence that does not show up in nature, neither does the love of God. For example, he asks... How do you know, this is the same basic section, how do you know that God is all love and kindness? Surely not through nature, for it is full of horrors. So, so in other words, this, that's why I depicted it in this way. How do you know that God is love? Where in mere history, if you cut out this, this, and this, where do you see that God is love or that he's going to reconcile us to himself or that he's going to make the world a better place? Where do you see that? And in the way the liberal means it, not even through the Bible. Because there we find the God who is a consuming fire from cover to cover. And such a God has at least, Machen says, such a God has at least one advantage over the comforting God of modern preaching. He's alive. He is sovereign. He is not bound by his creation or by his creatures. He can perform wonders. Now, underneath the liberal's uncomprehending stare at the old gospel is his love of nature. Not the love of appreciation and thanksgiving to God for nature, Rather, a worship of nature, a trust in nature as it is. And that's a view that the liberal religion shares with all other false religions and viewpoints, is a, is a trust in nature, that, that it's the way liberals, liberal just says that it's getting better. 
Now, the, for the Greek, it was a cyclical view. But the liberal is going to trust that history is going. It's, in, in that sense, there's a very modern idea to it, that it is inevitably getting better. Skip that. Um, well, he says, a cardinal doctrine of modern liberalism is that the world's evil may be overcome by the world's good. No help is thought to be needed from outside the world. So that's kind of what I'm depicting there. Uh, at this point of bringing nature to the aid of salvation, we can see that modern liberalism and modern Arminianism have a common thread in their Pelagian doctrine. And Machen spends a couple of pages on that as well. And I'm just looking at the time and seeing how far, because there was a lot of pages, there's a lot of notes, because it was 40 pages, so I'm just seeing what to skip. And, and this is kind of my last point anyway. But um, let's see what to, what to cover here. Yeah. The modern, uh, sorry, the Arminian doctrine before liberalism came around. I'm not suggesting, by the way, that liberalism comes entirely from Arminianism in the same nations only, because, of course, you can point to lib sorry, Lutheran roots to liberalism, too. After all, liberalism, we tend to think of it as, as happening in, in Germany. So there, there's, I can tell you straight lines that you can draw from Lutheran pietism to liberalism. So, I'm, you know, we have a short amount of time, so I'm not trying to paint with too broad of a brush here. But the Arminian doctrine had, in the few centuries leading up to the 20th century, been driving the minds of churchmen to exactly these sorts of assumptions about God and man and sin and law and Christ and the Spirit's work. In other words, about every single doctrine of the Christian faith until at last modern liberalism has come to full bloom. And against all that, that nature and what we're already doing, what we already have in common, that is what is getting better. That is what God's blessing. That's what God's using. Against this, Machen says that in Christianity, you've got these two other things. You've got regeneration and justification. He says regeneration and justification stand at the very beginning of the Christian life. And that's another important contrast. I wish I could have made a chart for this too, but try to picture this. Liberalism sees all men as the opposite of regeneration and justification. It sees all men as already alive to God and already innocent before God. Right? So they, they can't believe in regeneration and justification because that would assume that you are dead and guilty. And so they have the opposite view. Christianity sees man beginning dead in sin and guilty before God. Christianity sees the gospel as a real supernatural beginning, a literal new birth, whereas liberalism sees no need for an actual new start, but only that progress that's already underway. And when all else fails, when the doctrinal arguments all wither away, the liberal charges the Christian gospel as being selfish for being so heaven-minded. Even when we do good, it's only for our private heavenly reward. Machen replies to this. He says, quote, it is perfectly true that the Christian is dissatisfied with the present world, but it is a holy dissatisfaction. It is a hunger and thirst after righteousness which our Savior blessed. And as Machen goes through the prob problem after problem that the liberal brings up in modern society, you know, what do you do about this? What do you do about this? Machen do, do, uh, you know, goes through those. And he notes that even where secular thinkers have rediscovered religion, not as true but as useful, the very thing that they rediscovered is poison. In other words, Machen's saying that secular men will, has now come to the place, and he's writing this in the 1920s, where some of them will say, you know what, maybe atheism was a mistake. Um, so he's already kind of discovering that. And uh, maybe we need religion after all, but we need it for society. We need it for law. We need it for all these, maybe, maybe we even need it for science. Less people were saying that, but we need it for something in society. Machen's saying in rediscovering it, the very thing they rediscover is poisoned. He says the trouble is that in being utilized, religion is also being degraded and destroyed. So in other words, people have wanted the moral flower of religion without bothering about the doctrinal roots. But in not tending to the root of the thing, the thing dies and the flower is lost as well. Do I have another slide? I don't. That's the last slide. So I actually did get through everything. Um, there's a lot I left out because it's 40 pages. Um, 
But I think those are the biggest things. And uh, next week we'll talk about the church, the last chapter. Questions or comments? How does the liberal define goodness of man? I don't know that there would be a, an agreed upon definition by them. Um, I think it's something that they take for granted. They simply say good and expect us all to agree with that definition, that we have some love for it. There's been different definitions that have been offered in modern Western history that we have some feeling. You even see this like the Anne Frank, the famous saying that even after all this, I still believe that there's a good in mankind and so on. And it's just that kind of thing, I think, is how they would define it, is that there's this at least a spark of, of love for each other. Some will go further. Some will say that we're all good and that um, when people go bad, it's, again, it's because of societal influences or whatever else. But I think they'll say it's a natural good, that we have it by nature. And um, I think that's all that I've ever heard is a very squishy. In your five points, you have E. Go oh, ahead. Yeah. But uh, what, one of the things that occurred before we got to the like environmental, you actually had the movement to not punish criminals by death. Right. And then you had the sacrifice of children. Yeah. Which is a conflict yeah. between what would be considered good by the liberal. Yeah. I think whenever you see contradictions in the liberal mind, you have an early hint at intersectionality. I think long before intersectionality came around, it was kind of already there. Because if you have an irrational worldview, there's going to be pieces that are always contradicting each other. And so you're always going to be at war with yourself in something like that. Um, we want to protect the sanctity of life, just not the most innocent and you know, helpless of all. Um, because their arguments against capital punishment... I just ran into the section in Kuiper's Common Grace where he talks about this, and there were those debates going on in his day. Uh, capital punishment debases the human being. Um, and, he, and he says, it's interesting, they never go to bat for the, for the person that's been murdered. It's only for the person that has, has done the murdering. And they also say, well, if they were consistent, what about wars? The same governments that institute capital punishment institute wars, but you're really worried about this one guy who's committed this murder and not about the thousands of people who are, in, in that sense, innocents that are being killed in the war. So, you, yes, you have this cognitive dissonance in the liberal mind, but he has to do it because he has, there has to be a hierarchy of uh, what he wants to protect. Sometimes it's bizarre trying to know what is he trying to protect? What is he trying to, what is his goal here? But, yeah. I'll give you another follow-up. Yeah. With the Kant's idea of perseverance of the state, yeah. how does that fit with some of the current two kingdoms views? Yeah. <laughs> I think they are split when I say they. Those that adhere to this radical two-kingdom view that's emerged especially in the last 20 years, it has roots that go back behind that. But I think they're split. I think some people are the real champions of the movement, and then others, I think, are just going along for the same motive that a lot of pastors try to make peace in their own congregations or try to have it both ways on some doctrine or some practice that they think will be controversial and split the church or scare people or whatever else. And of course, nothing does that more than politics. And so um, that's, I think, it's, I think it's sometimes no more complicated than that is you have good old-fashioned cowardice that's um, coming up with spiritual and pious reasons to distract from the fact that they just don't want to talk about scary stuff that's going to make people uncomfortable. You know, there's two things you, put in, you don't talk about in polite society, religion and politics, which is a nice way of saying there's two things you don't talk about in polite society, uh, the highest reality that's spiritual and the highest reality that's temporal. In other words, the two things you don't talk about are everything and everything. 
That's a good way to get liquidated. By the way, the first who, who first said there's two things you don't talk about in polite society? I don't know. I always tell people you never heard of him because he was probably liquidated very shortly thereafter. <laughs> because it's not a really discerning thing to say. So I, I think that's my answer to that. I think a lot of it's motivated by just trying to keep peace. And, and then, of course, if, if, if you can't talk about and this is, uh, I think, Erwin Ir- Lutzer's points in some of his books about, not, or Dietrich Bonhoeffer in, in you know, Cost of Discipleship. He was writing at the time. Um, if you can't talk about things outside of your church walls, one of the things you can't talk down to is, is the guy with the, with the funny mustache and the brown shirt. Right? And if you can't talk down to him, well, then the church is not going to resist him. They're just going to give it a free pass. So the state's, the statist's greatest nightmare is the church awakening to its prophetic calling, um, which is speaking truth to every area of life, including the state. Three more minutes. A buzzer beater? Anybody have one more? I just found that um, first chart with the collective and the individual, that, that just said to me right there, there's society, and if you don't fit that yeah. mold, then you're eligible to be eliminated. Yes. According to them. Yeah. You major and candidate. Yeah. that's scary. Yeah. That impulse is always there in human beings. The herd in, in instinct yeah. and, and the bully that whips up the herd uh, into, into that. So that, that's always there. But in modern ideology, it's just put on hyperjet because um, statism of the modern variety is, a, is, is all of those things sort of coming together to, uh, to create a new, highest, unbreakable, irreversible allegiance. And um, anyway, that's another class. <laughs> all right, well, let me, let me pray. Father God, we thank you for your gospel, your true gospel and the true cross of your son Jesus Christ and in this is love Lord help us to never forget that and to never be distracted by cheap alternatives we thank you for that grace that is in your son and we pray that that would be what is highlighted and glorified this morning in all we do we pray it in Jesus name amen